Well, he got us all revved up and lathered up a, a little while ago, and, and he's back uh, for an encore performance before he has to head back to Erie. And we know how busy he is. Uh, all of our priests are on Palm Sunday weekend. So another hand for Father Larry Richards. Okay. I'm usually, I usually do this talk first. It's a more gentle talk than the other one, but because of the schedule, it's the way I had to do it. Sorry. Now, people have been asking, I'm going to very briefly go back so you don't have to drive those poor women crazy about the Be a Man book. It's an easy book. Ha! You have to do the 30 things. Some of you, I know you got it last year, but if you didn't do the 30 things in here, you're not a man yet. You got to do all 30. Don't give me excuses why you don't. Now, people ask, what's the difference between a Be A Man book and the CDs or the DVD? I wrote the book in uh, Gethsemane, then I preached it for 10 weeks to about 200 men. And then I took the two of them, put them together, and created the book. So this, though, is me raw. This is me edited by a woman, Ignatius Press. So there's two entirely different realities. Everything I would say here, she says, Father, you can't say that. Men will get it. No, we ain't going to put that in. So this is me nice and gentle or gentler. This is me raw, if you want to know the difference. They also have a, this, I didn't write it. It was put up by a study guide, but it's great for men's groups and that to go through the scriptures for the study guide. My new book that just came out is Surrender. Some people think this is stronger than the Be a Man book, but it talks more about how you need to let God be in charge of your life and how do you know what God wants you to do because most men live life their way. This will help you to live God, life God's way and how to do that on a daily basis. Then the CDs are all pretty typical. We have Life in the Holy Spirit, which is 11 half-hour talks, which is a little bit everything. And you have Surrender, which is, uh, we based, already went through that. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is my second to last one just came out. It's me gentle. This is for people, if you know someone who lost a baby or who had a miscarriage or just went through a loss of a husband or a wife, this is how God says to us, let not your hearts be troubled. So it's a more gentle and a more healing type thing. I just put this one out, this brand new last week, it's called Family, and uh, how to have a good family, what to do in your family, and the very basic stuff. This is what you must do to have a good family. Then Confession, which is old, Truth, which is old, Mass Explain, which is old, old. Knowing God's will is how to experience God and what to uh, do when you get to know God. What more could he do for you? This is the kick in the butt of a uh, passion talk. It's very intense. It's two CDs, but it's very intense. You don't want to listen to this while you're driving. Just, just don't want to do it. <laughs> this one's on prayer. It's going to talk about prayer now is what we're going to talk about, how to pray. And this actually takes you through a how-to experience of prayer. And then there's one called No Regrets. This isn't mine. It's put out by one of our newest speakers called Robert Rogers. Robert is a man who loved the Lord. He has a great love of God. And he met his wife, and they ran off, and they got married, and they tithed from the moment they were married. And they did all these great things. And then they had five kids, or four kids, and one day they're driving from a, after a, ice cream after a wedding. And as she's driving, and that starts raining, they get into a flash flood. It takes them into the river. Robert kicks out the windows. Him and his four kids and his wife go out. The next day, he wakes up in a hospital. The police officer comes in and says, I'm very sorry to tell you, but your wife and children were killed last night. So he lost his four kids and his wife in one moment. And then he said, the Lord gave, the Lord take it, take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Gentlemen, how many of us, you know, one bad thing happened to us and we get all mad at God and we think, you know, God doesn't love me. He lost his four children and his wife. And the other thing he said, though he slay me, still I will praise him. The God, he loved God even though God took everything he loved away from him. And the reality is he knew that what he would do was going to get them to heaven. He knows they're in heaven, and he started this foundation, Mighty is the Land, that actually sits there and has, he has an orphanage in each of, uh, in countries just for each of his children and his wife that he lost. So many children have come to life because of the death of his children. But it's a way to, do I love God because God is God, not what does he do for me? Like often I sit there and say, if the only reason you follow Jesus Christ is because you're afraid to go into hell, then who do you really love? Yourself, it's an act of selfishness. It's not an act of love. And so we have to transform it and let everything God take control, okay? So let's pray. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated. And you, O God, shall renew the face of the earth. Amen.
In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, gentlemen, the point of everything I've been talking about today is to make you a saint. Huh? Like I once gave a talk to 2,000 kids up in uh, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, huh? Halifax, Nova Scotia. And while I was up there, there were six bishops behind me. And there was a 2,000 kids there. It was a Steubenville conference. I used to do a lot of Steubenville conferences and uh, high school conferences. So anyway, I got up and I was the first speaker. And uh, it was the middle of Mass, and I got up to the kids, and the bishops were behind me, and I said, kids, you have two choices. You become a saint, or you go to hell. Well, you should have seen the bishops behind me. <laughs> they all looked like they were constipated. Like, boom, 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 boom. Now, we made it through, but I wanted to make sure that I made an impression on the kids. And so I try to do that. You know, like my style is, I try to make people laugh. I'll punch them in the stomach. Then I'll make them laugh. I'll punch them in the stomach. That way they can take it a little better, right? You know, and it's to make an effect so they'll always remember, like, whoa, he told me I better be a saint or go to hell. But is that true? Yes. 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 If you make it to heaven, you're going to be a saint. If you don't, you're going to be in hell. So is that your goal is to become a saint? You know, again, those of you who already went to confession and those of you who will go to confession after this talk, you got to remember Christianity is never the focus on self, but always the forgetfulness of self. So once you confess something, it's gone forever. Jesus Christ pays the penalty for it, correct? You know, the devil will try to bring up your f past, but if the devil brings up your past, you remind him of his future and you tell him to go to hell. Huh? You're allowed to tell Satan to go to hell. God did it. You can do the same. So but the devil will love to keep you focused on yourself and your past. That's never of God. Once anything's been confessed, never of God. You're called to be focused on Jesus and the future. Remember St. Peter? St. Peter could walk on water, right? As long as he was looking at Jesus. But as soon as he looked at himself, I can't walk on water, I'm just a sinful man. Or as long as he looked at the, uh, the storm around him, there's a storm going on, I can't do this, he fell. But the way he got picked back up was he said, Jesus, help me. And Jesus picked him up and said, why did you falter? So gentlemen, the key to living and being a man of God is to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and the future, never on ourselves and our past. Okay? So those of you who already went to confession, you are a saint, right? If you're to drop dead right now, you get to go right to heaven. So some of you might be the only way that gets you there, so I really should kill you now just so you make it. But anyway, <laughs> that's the reality. You drop dead, you go right to heaven, right? You don't have to focus on yourself. And you're, well, Father, I'm really a sinful person. Oh, we know. Oh, Father, I deserve damnation. Oh, we know. That's why you have a Savior that paid the penalty for you. That's what we believe, huh? So when you go to confession, you are brand spanking new. But how do you become this man? How do you live? What does this sanctity look like? Well, it comes from St. John Vianney. St. John Vianney says this, this is the glorious duty of man, that we pray and that we love. So the two things you got to focus on for the rest of your life, to keep it simple, focus on these two things. You got to pray and you got to, you got to, and you got to, if you do that, you're going to make it to sanctity. Let's look at the prayer first. Prayer, gentlemen, is not about, say, about saying a bunch of words to a God who may or may not be up there, right? Prayer is listening to God, right? But this is the way most men pray. It's like getting married but never consummating. You know what consummation means? Having sex. You never have sex, even on your honeymoon, right? And so some of you say, well, I remember, I, I, that's about what I have now, Father. I've been married. I used to often tell kids, I'm a big pusher of vocations, you know. Often I'll sit there and say, bam! Almost every boy here I saw, I say, bam, be a priest. And look at me, huh? I said be a priest. Uh, and then one guy looked at me once a couple years ago and he says, Father, I'd be a priest, but I want to have sex. Very explicit. I said, oh, son. After five years of marriage, you'll be as celibate as me. <laughs> That's what I've heard anyway. They tell me. <laughs> you know, I said, after five years, you're just like me anyway, except for Christmas and Easter maybe. I don't know. But the reality is your birthday, whatever it is, that that's it. So, but then the reality is, but they'll sit there. One kid looked at me once and he says, Father, I said, I said what are you going to be? He said, I'm going to be a doctor. I go, ooh, a doctor, huh? And I said, why only go halfway? What? I says, as a doctor, if you're a good doctor and a lucky doctor, you'll keep people alive for a hundred years. 
I can keep people alive forever. <laughs> go ahead, you go be a doctor. <sighs> but it's true. We need you boys to sit there, and everyone who's not made to really think about priesthood. You know, we need people that are willing to lay down their life. We don't need uh, fake priests. We don't need lazy priests. We need holy priests, huh? A priest who's willing to lay down his life every day for his people. If you don't really do that, don't, when I pick, I, I do priest retreats. I was just, I did Springfield, Missouri's priest retreat in uh, Branson a couple months ago. And there was all the priests of the diocese there and a retired bishop and a new bishop. <laughs> After I was done with three days with these priests, four days with these priests, the bishop got up and he goes, Father Larry Richards, you are a bull in a china shop. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. That's exactly true. But the reality is, once I was done, we had over 3,000 kids in Springfield another uh, doing a uh, conference. And we had, it was a big place, so we had all these 3,000 kids there. And I said, gentlemen, at the end we have a, a vocation call. And I said, gentlemen, how many of you are willing to be priests of Jesus Christ? How many of you would be willing to lay down your life for Christ? This isn't a time for wimpy priests. It's a time for holy priests. You're going have to die. How many of you are willing? I want you to come down and stand on this stage. Out of the 3,000 uh, kids that were there, how many kids, boys, you think I had come down? 400. 400, gentlemen. Then I had, we had these beautiful nuns there in full habits. Oh, glory be. Young, full habits, full glorious. They were happy. They were going around. And I said, girls, you see these brides of Christ? How many of you are willing to marry Jesus Christ and have him as your spouse? Girls, let me give you a hint. He's better than any man you'll find on this earth. Promise. How many of you girls would be willing to be open to becoming a bride of Jesus Christ by being a nun? You know how many girls I had come down? Over 600, gentlemen. That when we have people that are strong, that are willing to give up their life for Christ, be it men or women, you have young people that are willing to do that. Gladly. But if a priest is just like anybody else, well, who wants to be that? You can be a social worker, you get more money for it. You need to lay down your life for others. And see, that's the key. But where we get that is in our prayer. So those of you who were paying any attention to me last talk, I said I would be speaking of a scripture verse this talk. And I told you to remember three letters, I mean three numbers. What were those numbers? One, one, one. So we go to Mark chapter 1, verse 11. One, one, one. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Everything began with Jesus, and remember, if you read my man's book, it sits there and they say, what's the most powerful, what do you think the most important uh, chapter of your book is, Father? And everybody thinks I'm going to say chapter 3 because it's a repentance. No, no, there is no chapter 3. There is no Christian life without chapter 2. Be a man who is God's beloved son. Gentlemen, you need to come to know in your heart that you're loved by God. Because until you come to know that you're loved, you're going to do everything out of fear, which is more about yourself than about God. You're going to do everything for yourself, you know, so you can be great, you can be holy. Love is a byproduct of your prayer life. When you come to know there, you know, like with the Father, everyone needs to hear at least once in their life, you are my beloved son. So have you ever heard that? You know, once to my spiritual director. My spiritual director was the, uh, he's the, uh, he's dying at this moment, but he is the exorcist of the Diocese of Erie. Now do you know why he's my spiritual director? But anyway, so when I was in college seminary, when I first met him, I was going, I go to confession a lot. Every two weeks, usually it takes me 20 minutes, I'm still a virgin, but I'd always, I'm always the first one to run the confession because I know how sinful I am. So as I was going to confession, he put his arm around me and he was walking in the confessional, it was, uh, we were out doing a retreat, and he says, what's your name? And I said, oh, my name's Larry Father. And he looked at me and he says, Larry, do you know how much God loves you? And I said, oh, yes, Father. And he went, whack! And he hit me really hard off the back of my head. And he said, liar. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to go to the confession of this guy. This is going to be great, huh? But he was right. I knew in my head that I was loved by God. But I had never experienced it in my heart. I had never had an experience that the Father loved me. I was just afraid that if God did exist, I wanted to make sure I didn't go to hell forever. So I was going to do all these good things. But that was all about me. Gentlemen, you need to come to know that you're loved. And so that homework that I gave you, the first, I'm going to give you two pieces of homework. That was the first piece. That you need to spend this week, this whole week, I want you to spend just meditating on that one verse. Mark 1.1.1. Because there it says, the sky opened up and the Father spoke and said, you are my beloved son. 
with whom I am well pleased. Most of us think that God is mad at us, that he's disappointed in us, that every time he looks at us, he's kind of sad because we're not perfect people. Gentlemen, that's why he sent a savior. None of us are gonna be perfect. If he could look at David and said, David, is a man after my own heart. He is beloved to me. He who is a murderer, a rapist, an idolater, how much more can he say that to you who have been redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ? So what has to happen, gentlemen, is you must come to know and experience that you are loved by the Father. You must. If not, you're acting out of every, you're not acting out of strength, you're acting out of weakness. So that has to happen with your prayer, which means, gentlemen, you're going to have to spend at least five minutes a day with God. And don't give me, you can't. I want you, before you leave here today, to promise Almighty God that you promise Him that every day for the rest of your life, you will give Him at least five minutes a day. And if you look at me and say, well, Father, I can't promise that, what a wimp you are. Don't even think you're a follower of Christ. If you can't promise him, you're going to give him five minutes a day. Don't even play that game. Oh, I follow Jesus. No, you don't. If you can't give God five minutes a day, you can't give God squat. That means you're fitting God into your life. Gentlemen, he must become first in your life. There's no other option here. Huh? Now, and that doesn't mean like when I pick on people and play sports. Does that mean you can't play sports? Say no, Father. You can be the top. You can be a state champion. Of course you can. You need to do that. But you always got to sit there and always ask yourself a question. Do I love sports more than I love God? If you do, you have a problem. Huh? If I walked into your house right now, would I see Iowa banners everywhere or hopefully Steeler things because God's a Steeler fan and you have all these things around? Do I, when I walk into your house, what do I experience about you? I experience what and who you love. So there might be all kinds of sports for me, because I'm a man, Father, but you are a man of God. That means when I walk in your house, can I see a crucifix? Can I see something that shows me you love Jesus Christ more than you love sports? Or do you love sports more than you love anything else? And you do that by what time you give to anything. So if you commit yourself for the rest of your life, but for the rest of your life, you will always give God five minutes of your day. Then you're going to start on the right road. When you go to pray, you got to make sure you experience God, right? So again, to go back to the analogy, you get married, but you never have sex. You walk into your spouse's room every day and you go, shh, and you continue. You start to pull out a little uh, poem book and you start reading your wife a poem every day. Sometimes you say the same poem every day, real fast. Sometimes you say 10 times the same poem. And then you go, shh, and then you go to work. And then at work, you're a really good spouse. You pick up the phone a couple times a day because you're a really good person. And you call your, wife, your spouse and go, hey, thank you for everything you do for me. You're the best. Yay, thank you. And you hang up. And then you come home and your wife's making you a beautiful dinner, but you don't talk to her. You go and do, read the paper or watch TV or do some work. Then right before you go to dinner, you're a really good spouse. So you go to your wife and say, thank you for this wonderful dinner. Same words every night, but you say it very fast because you're starving. You don't talk to your wife at all during dinner. And then after dinner, you're 1% of 1% that looks at her and says the same words every night. Thank you, that was great. Then you go watch TV, read the paper, do some work, whatever, for the rest of the night. And then right before you go to bed, you walk into your spouse's room and you pull out your book of poems. And you go, I read this one. You read it real fast. Or you read the same one another. Or you read 10 times or whatever. Or most of the time you go, well, she knows I love her. I'm just going to go to bed. Okay? And you do that every year, every day for 50 years. What kind of relationship would that be? Some of you guys are saying, that'd be the best relationship in the whole wide world, Father. Could I have one of those, please? It would be a horrible relationship, huh? And yet that's what we do with God. We say our prayers. We say the same prayer every day. And God says, excuse me, could I talk to you now? <laughs> no, God, I'm busy, really. Huh? I have my new book coming out. It's going to be called Just Live It, which is going to be a reflection on the Lord's Prayer. Because most people, I, I think they see, people see say the Lord's Prayer every day, but they don't mean it. Like, for instance, someone comes to me and says, Father, I'm having a bad day. I go, oh, did you thank God for your bad day? I did not. Did you say the Lord's Prayer this morning? I did. Did you say your will be done? I did. Well, this is his will for you. Why aren't you thanking him for it? Well, that ain't what I meant. Exactly. This is the way we should pray the Lord's Prayer if we pray what we mean. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please bless it. Here, God, this is what I want you to do for me today. Instead of, Lord, what do you want of me today? 
And then you sit there long enough so he can tell you. Now, when he tells you things, it might be things you don't like. It might be something like, I want you to make peace with that person, your neighbor next door you haven't talked to in a year. I will not. And he says, you do as I say. I told you to go make peace. I want you to make peace with your brother who you had that fight with six years ago and you haven't talked to each other in six years. You don't you dare come to the altar again until you make peace with your brother. Oh, well, I will not. Then you will not go to communion again. God will start telling you what he wants of you, and then you're going to have to start doing it. That means you become a slave of Jesus Christ. Huh? My favorite uh, verse in the thing in the, in the Word of God is, Paul, comma, a slave of Jesus Christ. Is that something we could introduce ourselves as? Hi, I'm Larry, comma, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And then can I live that? Do I live every day doing my will and asking God to bless it? Or do, my, do I go to God every day in prayer and say, God, I'm going to do your will today. No matter what you want, I'll do. And trust me, gentlemen, that's going to be the hardest prayer you pray. When Jesus said, your will be done to the Father, what happened? He died. But gentlemen, he lives now. Everything you do, you're going to have to go to the cross first. But you're going to live forever. He promises you that. Huh? But you're going to have to be man enough to take it and say, okay, I'm going to die to myself and die to the, the I'm going to have the cross today so I can move on. So you must become a man of prayer. What's the second thing you must do? You become a man of love. huh? Now, love, you know, again, what I have seen in the church today, even at men's conferences in different places, that there is an ultra-righteousness around. You know what a righteousness is? That the people, I'm an ultra-conservative. My bishop calls me right of Trent, right? Now, you have to explain that to the people next to you. have no idea what Trent was. It was a council of the church. But anyway, so, but nowadays where I go, there are these people that are always watching. Hmm, ah, what Father said, I don't think it's teaching in a church. Ah, and then they're evil. You know, they go around, and all they do is judge other people because that way they don't have to judge themselves. And they sit there and say, this is the teaching of the church, and they're angry about it. And they're always going around judging. Isn't it amazing? I often tell, I was just in Ireland, I spoke to all the dioceses in Ireland last summer, and I said, I don't give two craps about your truth if you're not going to do it in love. So that means, gentlemen, don't you ever open your mouth to anybody unless you're willing to love them. Because your judgment is forbidden by Almighty God. He has forbidden you to judge, and yet we judge all the time because it makes us feel righteous. This is the teaching of the church! Ah! You ever met people like that? You know people like that. Huh? They're just mean, miserable human beings. To me, the surest sign of a follower of Christ is joy. Right? It comes from the Bible. I have told you all this in John chapter 15. I have told you all this so my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And so a person of joy is a person of love. So ask your wife when you get home, sweetie pie, am I a person of joy? And then when they go, oh, jeez, you know what it's like to live with you? Sit there and think about it, because that means you're not a person of love. We easily judge other people. Like if your kids don't go to church, when you judge them, guess what happens? They'll never come back to church because of you. Because judgment, which you're forbidden, no, nothing good can come out of something that's not of God. And if God forbid you to judge, when you judge somebody, nothing good can come out of it because no fruit can be born out of sin, right? So no fruit will ever come out of your judging your family. None. It'll draw them farther away from God. And when you stand before God and you thought you were righteous, in my house, this is the way it's going to go. That's called Phariseeism. Love is you always meet the person where they're at. And your love will transform them. Remember how Jesus did it? When Jesus met the woman caught in adultery, she was naked. She was thrown before him. The law, who, what he wrote... He's God. He wrote the law. The law said she should be stoned. That's what the law says. So here's this naked woman thrown before Jesus. The, all the judges went around and says, Jesus, the law says that she should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And he starts writing in the ground. We have no idea what he wrote in the ground. None. But probably tradition has it that he wrote the commandments in the ground. And then he looked up at the people and said, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Then everybody left. 
And then he was alone with the woman. And he says, does anyone condemn you? And what did she say? No one, sir. And then Jesus, who is God, who wrote the law, says, neither do I condemn you. Isn't that amazing? But we get off condemning others, don't we? We watch Fox News and we watch all these things. And some people say I remind them of Glenn Beck, don't I? Well, first of all, Glenn Beck's ex-Catholic became Mormon and I'm better looking. Shut up. But anyway, we watch these people and we do that and we judge other people and like, oh yeah, I love it. Why? Because I love to judge other people. Does anyone condemn you, sir? No one. The man? No one, sir. Then what does Jesus say? Neither do I condemn you. But then he says, now sin no more. Gentlemen, the only way you can ever bring anybody to Christ is to love them, and then you challenge them. Like I tell people, you want to bring people to Jesus, what you're called to do? There are three things you need to do. First thing is you start praying for them. You put a name, you put their name on a prayer thing. Because when you pray for somebody, gentlemen, you become like a magnifying glass. You ever put a out in the sun and the sun is out and the magnifying glass you put on, it takes all the, uh, the rays of the sun and sets it free and focuses it on that something and sets it on fire. Well, when you and I pray for people, we become this magnifying glass and we place ourselves over the person or situation and the grace of God, which has taken them through us, focuses on them and the Holy Spirit sets them on fire. So before you say anything to anybody, you pray for them. The second thing you do to bring someone to Jesus, and this continues, this is your family, your wives, your kids. The second thing you do is you love them. You love them, and you love them, and you love them. That woman knew she was loved by Jesus. That gave her the power to sin no more. Another example of that way Jesus deals with people is he dealt with the, the, the uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who everybody hated. He looked up at him and Zacchaeus, today I will have dinner with you in your house. Can you imagine? He was going to eat with a sinner, right? Someone, when I was in Buffalo, I did a men's conference and someone says, Father, can I talk to you? Sure. And he says, my, my daughter's a lesbian and she's getting married. Should I go to the wedding? Now, what do you think I said? I said, will Jesus be there? Yes, he will, as a matter of fact. So who are you not to be there? That means I'm going to sit there and say it's okay what she did. Oh, no, 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 no. You're going to eat and drink with sinners. That's what happens when you eat and drink with your family, people. And that's what happens when they eat and drink with you. You're a sinner too. Who are you to judge anybody else? You will be there and you will love your daughter. And then your love will help her to be set free from the sin she's in. But if you say, I refuse to go, the only thing they're going to know about you is you're filled with judgment. Who the heck wants to be like you? Why would they even think about being a Christian if that's what it is? Someone who won't even love their daughter. You love people where they're at, but you don't love them enough to leave them there. You love them so they can grow. So you must meet people, especially your family, where they are. You don't want to leave them there. We all want to bring people from sin, correct? What will bring people from sin, our judgment or our love? Our love. That's the way Jesus did it. Isn't it amazing? We all have it memorized, don't we? John 3, 16. What's John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that anyone who believes in him may not die but have everlasting life. He loved the world that he got amongst us, and we killed him. But he still loved us enough to have fellowship, table fellowship with us. But then go to verse 17, which nobody ever quotes. Verse 17 says, God sent his son, and though God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save it. I know a lot of Catholics that are in this whole business to condemn the world instead of saving the world. You know what it is to be a Christian? Is when you hope and pray that the person you hate the most on earth gets to sit next to you forever in heaven. Is that what you want? That's called loving your enemies. They'll be redeemed and so will you, okay? So the first thing you do is pray for people. The second thing you do is love them. The third thing you do is you tell them. That means you witness to them about Jesus and his love. You witness what Jesus Christ has done for you. You don't preach, you witness. Preaching is what I'm doing now. Witnessing is, you know what I was like? Well, I was a sinner, and he loved me enough that he changed my life, and he has given me peace, and that's what I want you to have. I want you to have peace. Not, I don't want you to go to hell forever, and if you keep doing that, you're going to be in hell forever. Boy, you sound like Father Larry. I know, it's where I got it. 
The reality is, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I can't be like this. This is the preaching thing, okay? So you got to love them. And so as you love them and your family, your love got to begin with your family. That's where, you know, sometimes I do a lot of deacon retreats too, and deacons look really, sorry deacons, but they can look really, really holy in the, on the altar. Oh, holy, 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 I'm a deacon. But then they treat their family like crap. And I say, when I do a deacon retreat, deacons, get the hell out of the ministry. If you don't love your family first, you stay home and learn to love them, then you can come on the altar. But don't you come on this altar unless you're loving your family first. That means you die for them. See, what that means, gentlemen, is you're giving your life away for your family. Like, again, I do a lot of uh, weddings. Again, I don't know why people ask me to do their weddings, because I'm not nice. You know, here's this guy and the girl there, and they're sitting there. I always start with the girl, and I say, sweet, I do this every single wedding. Just imagine, sweetheart, yes, father. You read the Bible every day, don't you? I always get, yes, Father. I say, you lie to a priest, you go to hell. No, Father. And I say, have you ever read the book of Ephesians, sweetie? And I always get, no, Father. Well, you know what it says to wives in the book of Ephesians? No, Father. Well, let me tell you what it says. It says, wives, be submissive to your husbands. And I always ask, do you think that's what it means? And I always get, no, Father. And then every single wedding, I always go, yes, that's what it means. And I jump up and down and I say, every day for the rest of your life, when you wake up, you got to say, how can I serve my husband? How can I put his needs in front of my own? Then all the women there are saying, die, Father, die. <laughs> Head starts spinning around, green throw up, die. Another reason I hate the Catholic Church. Ah! I kind of enjoy it myself. All the guys are like, all the guys are saying, yeah, Father, I wouldn't say it, but yeah, Father, you tell him. Once I looked at a guy and I said, son, that'll be another hundred bucks from you. And he looked at me and he says, best hundred bucks I ever spent, Father. Now, while everybody's there, all the women are saying, die, Father, die. Anyone who knows me knows I am an equal opportunity offender. The other shoe is about to fall. So all the guys are like, yeah, yeah, you tell her, Father, you tell him. And I say, son, you read the Bible every day, don't you? And I say, no, Father. I said, well, you ever read the book of Ephesians? No, Father. Well, you know what it says after it says, wives, be submissive to your husbands? No, Father. Let me tell you. It says, husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. And I say, you know what that means, son? No, Father. Your life is over. Ha! Every day when you wake up, you got to sit there and say, how can I die for my wife? How can I put her needs in front of my own? Huh? That's what it means. That every day you're going to do something unselfishly for another human being. And I always say, guys, you want to make that real? Tonight when you're home and you just want to have a beer because you had to listen to Father Larry for two hours, well, an hour and 50 minutes. After you sat there and you had to listen to our Father Larry for an hour and 50 minutes, you were tired, you were mad, you couldn't stand him, he was arrogant, you didn't like him at all. And all you want to do is watch some sports and have a beer. And then your wife comes walking in the room. And you go, I'm sorry, sweetheart. And you take that remote control and you hand it to her and say, here, we'll watch anything you want to watch. That shows you just died for your wife, gentlemen. Can you die for your wife on a daily basis? Or is it all about you and what you want? To be a man of love means you give up your life for your wife and your kids every day. Huh? And that means you got to affirm them. you got to build them up. We all know you can tell them what's wrong with them. When was the last time you told them what was right with them? Huh? If the only thing you are is the guy that comes in and lays down the law. Ooh. You're a real man. Yeah, they're going to be happy when you're dead. You know, that's about as simple as it is, because that's all you were cared about. I laid down the law. I was the lawgiver. You need to be the example of love. So when you die, they will cry so bad, because there's no one on this earth that loved me as much as my dad did. Do your kids know that you love them? Not that you were a strong disciplinarian. And that doesn't mean you're not a disciplinarian. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is kick your kid in the butt. Trust me on this. But do you love them, and do they know that? And do you tell the people you love that you love them? Huh? See, that's the hard thing. Because when I go different places, you know, the deepest need in all of our hearts, gentlemen, is to be loved. And we try everything to fill up that emptiness inside. Huh? People in India are so hungry, Mother Teresa used to tell a story about, that they would actually pick up dog dung and eat it. So we try to fill up the emptiness with all this garbage. 
And that's what we talked about in confession. The only thing that will fill up your emptiness is the love of God, I promise you. So that means that we have to bring that love of God to others. So it begins with our family. So you've got to tell the people you love that you love them. How often do you think? Every day. Now, some of you are looking at me like, a oh, father, no, that's not. I'm German. Germans don't do that. You know, no, Germans aren't do that. Or, Father, I'm Italian. I do it anyway. Oh, we love it. I love you. No, I love you. I love you more. You know, there's a guy in Peoria, a big Italian, a big Italian deacon. And every time I get off the plane, if I'm doing a men's conference here, he has to come up to me and kiss me on my lips and hug me real tight. And I go, thank you, deacon. You know, I'm Italian, Father. Okay, thank you. So Italians might do it all the time. You say, oh, Father, I'm Irish. We do it when we're drunk. You don't let your culture determine your faith. Your faith needs to determine your culture, huh? That means you got to do it. Now, this became so real to me years ago. I have one of my kids. This is, he's 42 years old now. He's not a kid. He served my first mass. He played uh, uh, soccer in high school. Then he was a kicker for Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. And then he became a kicker for Detroit, okay? Became a professional uh, uh, football player. And so anyway, when he was still, he was a freshman in college, and we'd go out, and I used, to, I, used to have, I used to have the biggest youth group in the Diocese of Erie, and so I used to take the kids out for pizza and wings and movies or whatever. And so one night, he's sitting there, and I'm finishing typing at my typewriter. Remember typewriters? And I'm typing at my typewriter, and this kid is quiet behind me, and he wasn't quiet normally. And so I got real quiet, and I says, what? And I turned around, and this big, big football player started to sob uncontrollably. And I can't take tears, especially for men. You know, okay, anything you want, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I never forget looking and saying, what's the matter, relax, what's the matter? Because he was crying so badly, he could hardly breathe. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I said, what's the matter? I'll never forget what this kid said to me. He says, Father, I'd do anything if my dad just told me once that he loved me. But the only thing this kid wanted from his dad was for his dad to tell him that he loved him. Now, his dad showed him. His dad never missed one of his games, anything. About 10 years ago, this kid, who's now a man, married and everything else, he calls me and says, Father, my dad's dying. Please, could you come over and anoint him? And I said, oh, sure. And I went over to the kid, the father's house, and I anointed the father. And later that afternoon, his father died. Not because I anointed him. It was his time. But anyway, so... <laughs> After the funeral, I sat there and I said to this man, I said, so-and-so, did your dad ever tell you that he loved you? And this man, again, professional football player, did all that stuff, again he started to shake. And again he started to sob. And he said, never, Father. That the only thing this kid, this man, ever, ever wanted from his dad was for his dad to tell him that he loved him. But he wasn't man enough to do it. Huh? How about you? Again, I grew up in the city of Pittsburgh. Like I said, both my parents were police officers. My mother graduated highest ever from the Pittsburgh Police Academy. I always said she missed her vocation. She should have been God. She knows everything. Just ask her. But anyway, and my father was a canine man, right? And so I had cops all around my life. They all expected me to be a cop too, and in many ways I am. But anyway, here I am growing up. Being a police officer is not an easy job. It wasn't then, and it isn't now. And so I got to know a lot of police officers. But every time you get a call as a police officer, it's always bad, right? Nobody ever calls you to say, hey, I want to tell you I'm having a good day. Someone killed someone, someone raped someone, someone stole something, someone's uh, beat up somebody. It's always bad, always, always bad. So some of them, to deaden the pain, become alcoholics and drink, and drink a lot. Huh? So I knew a lot of police officers became very bad alcoholics. One in particular, he left his wife and he left the Pittsburgh police force and he flew out to Las Vegas because everybody's happy in Las Vegas. Did you know that? He was, yeah. And so he got a new wife and new kids out there. He even got a big blue Cadillac. This is 29 years ago. And Cadillacs in those days, that meant you arrived. Now you need your Lexus. But in those days, it was a Cadillac, huh? And so he had his big blue Cadillac, new wife, new kids. He was head of security at Circus Circus, one of the, we used to be a big uh, casino out there. Not anymore, but it's still there. Anyway, so after a couple years, he found out everyone wasn't happy at Las Vegas. Can you imagine? So he moved to Houston, Texas, because everybody's happy in Houston, Texas. Did you know that? So he came there with his new wife, new kids, and his new car, and he became head of security at one of the largest hospitals in the nation in a suburb of Houston called Katy, Texas. But he kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And this man, at 43 years old, was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. Now, 33, 43 is young, isn't it? 
baby. I'm 52. He was a lot younger than me. You know, he was three or four days before his 44th birthday. And I walked in the ICU room because his wife called me on the phone at the time, and I was a senior in college seminary at the time. And she says, Larry, I know you're very busy, but he's dying. You think you come out here and be with him? And I said, well, of course, I'm a seminarian. That's what we do. And I flew out to Houston, Texas. When I walked in the ICU room, I was not prepared for what I saw. Here was this man, 43 years old, a couple days before his 44th birthday. And he was in the ICU room all by himself. He had pure white hair. He had no fat on his body. He looked like he was 99 years old, dying of AIDS. And he was 43 years old. And, I, and he couldn't talk to me because he was on a respirator. And I walked in the ICU room and I said, you look like hell. And he kind of smiled, but he couldn't say, I have a negative humor if you haven't been able to figure this out yet. And he kind of smiled and he couldn't say anything to me. He was writing to me on this blackboard. And I spent a week with this man, praying with him, being with him, doing as best I could. But I had to go back to school. I was a senior in college at the time. And so this is in September. So I'll never forget the last time I was with him. There he is laying in bed. And I walked over and I spent like an hour with him. And I said, listen, I got to go. But you know, I'm going to be graduating from college in May. And boy, it would be great if you could be there. And he shook his head up and down, but we both knew this wasn't going to happen. This man was going to die. And I said, okay, listen, i got to go, but I'll pray for you, okay? Doesn't that sound holy? Us priests and seminarians, we can sound so holy. Sound, oh, oh, please, Father. I hope I'll pray for you. So I start walking out of the room. Well, as I start walking out of the room, I knew it would be the last time I ever saw this man. So I turned around to get one last look at him. And as I turn around to get one last look, here he is desperately calling me back, desperately with his hands. And I'm thinking something's terribly wrong. So I ran around the other side of bed. I go, what's the matter? What's the matter? What can I do for you? And this man took me and he grabbed me and he called me so close to himself. And as he's holding me so close to himself, this was 29 years ago. It feels like it was two seconds ago. As he's holding me so tight, I look up at him and I go, yeah, I love you too, dad. And a little later, my dad died. The only time I ever told my dad that I loved him was on his deathbed. Why? Because he wasn't the type of dad I wanted. He was an alcoholic, and he was a mean alcoholic. And I spent my whole life judging my father instead of loving my father. Huh? Isn't it amazing? We all say we're followers of Jesus here, right? Jesus Christ only gave us one commandment, just one. John chapter 13, verse 34. He said, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And then in verse 35, he says, this is how all people will know you're my disciples, that you love each other, period. Then he forbid us to judge. And I spent my whole life judging my father instead of loving him. Maybe the only thing my dad wanted, who's, who's my grandfather, his father was an alcoholic, street bum. We wouldn't know where my granddad was. We'd be driving around the city of Pittsburgh, and then over there in the gutter in the park, there was my granddad. We'd have to pick him up and put him in the car. And my dad swore he'd never be like his father, but he died of the same disease even earlier. Judgment doesn't bring life to anybody. I, who was a righteous seminarian, was wrong what my father was doing, and I judged him. Maybe the only thing my father needed was for his firstborn son to love him instead of judge him. I am so glad that the last thing I ever said to my dad was, I love you. How about you? Gentlemen, you're going to die. I promise. And when you're laying in your deathbed, I've been in the deathbed of thousands of people throughout the years. It's not going to matter. You were a great Iowa fan. You had lots of money. You were a doctor, a lawyer, a judge. Nobody really cares. You're going to die and face God. And he's not the least bit impressed with any of us. While you're laying there dying, the only thing that's going to matter to you is your relationships. I promise. Who you loved and who loved you back. I promise. And so as you're lying there, you're going to be most concerned about meeting God so that I spend time with him, that I prove to God that I loved him by spending time with him every day. And the people you loved, your wife, your children, or whoever's in your life, that's going to be the only thing that matters. I promise you, gentlemen. So if that's the only thing that's going to matter, then you got to start working today to make that day a day of no regrets. So you got to decide today, and this is going to be your homework, that you have to sit there. We're going to start with the kids first, okay? Guys. You have to write two letters before you go to bed tonight, those who are not married. One to your mom, one to your dad. And you got to tell them that you love them and why. No, you can't sit there and say, dear dad, I love you, man, Joe. Doesn't count. 
you got to say why. If you're estranged from one of your parents, that's the letter you write first, because it's their blood in your veins, and to hate them is to hate yourself. You must make peace with them. If your parents have died, then you, you write to them in heaven. But you got to write the letter. Guys, adults who have kids, if you have 10 kids, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> if you read my Be a Man book, this is one of the 30 things. You can check it off finally at the back of the book. You have to write to each of your children and tell them that you love them and why. And no, you cannot write one on the computer and change everybody's name at the top. You have to handwrite each letter. And as you do this, some of you have to do it to your wives, because remember how you used to be with your wife? You wouldn't get off the phone with her. Hey, I love you. No, I love you more. You hang up. No, I can't hang up. You hang up. No, I won't hang up. And you're doing that for two hours. Now it's, oh, shut up. Bang. But remember that? When you used to love them so much and you'd tell them that? Maybe it's time for you to write your wife a letter. But I ain't going to make you do that. Some of you are older, have to write your parents for to letters. They might be 80 years old. Well, they never told me they loved me. Well, get over yourself. You be the first one. You start it. And as you sit there and write that letter, this is the way I want you to write the letters. As if by tonight, midnight, you or they would be dead. Because this could happen, gentlemen. You have no idea. And let me give you a hint. Some of you, and then what you have to do for the rest of your life is you have to tell the people you love how often? Every day. Now, for some of you men, this is going to kill you. Good. It's about time you die for your family. But let me give you a hint. Some of you are not going to do this. You're going to look at me and say, how with you, Father? Who are you? I'm just a priest of Jesus Christ here to save your miserable soul. And you're not going to sit there and you're not going to do it, right? So let me give you a hint. If you do this, you'll have no regrets when you're dying. You're not going to be laying there taking your last breath. <gasps> I can't believe I told my wife and my kids that I loved them every day. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I promise you that'll never happen. Promise. But if you don't, while you're laying there dying, knowing this is your last moment on earth, you're going to regret your miserable life. You'll regret it with every breath. You're going to say, why was I so selfish? Why couldn't I tell my wife and my kids that I love them every day? Why was I so stingy with my words? That's the only thing that's going to matter. I promise. So if you decide to live your life from this day forward, being a man of love and being a man of prayer, when the Lord calls you home, you won't regret it. You'll be happy a miserable, loudmouth priest came from Erie, Pennsylvania and made you mad because that's the only thing that's going to matter. So, gentlemen, I got to get a plane. But I want you to sit there and think this is your homework. You got to pray, you got to love, you got to spend time with Mark 111, you got to write those letters to your kids, your spouse. And you got to decide that from this day forward, there will never be a day that you don't tell the people you love that you love them. And if you do these two things, you pray and you love, you're going to be a saint. You're going to live forever. Your life will be worth living. Your life will help to change the world. You got it? Get it? Going to do it? Okay, gentlemen. I ask you to pray for me. Also, the way, a good way to do the no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed is to go to Twitter. I Twitter every morning. I send a kick in the butt with the Word of God in the morning. So I'll send you a scripture verse every morning early with a little thing about what to do better. And then every night I'll send you a comforting scripture. All you have to do is go to Twitter, sign up, and put my name, no period, just Father, F-R-L-A-R-R-Y, Richards. I make you a promise. For the rest of my life, I will pray for you twice a day, every morning, every night. I promise. So I ask you, those of you who have prayer lists, to please pray for me. Because, let's be real, there's no more arrogant priest you ever met in all your life, is there? I know. So the devil wants me, and if he takes me, he's going to take a lot of people with me. So you got to pray that I never do anything to embarrass the church. I never do any scandal. I always stay faithful to Jesus and his church. So I count on your prayers, please, and you can count on mine. God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.